I think now. Yes, perfect. So. Okay. Okay, it works. Uh, good evening. I am very glad yes. to welcome yes. Professor Chris Rapley to our module for emerging fields in architecture today. Today, we have an important to topic. We talk about climate change, but also about finding the agency to act. And before Professor Rapley will summarize the messages of climate science and show how insights from the mind sciences are helping accelerate so societ societal action. Um, please let me introduce him shortly. Professor Chris Rapley is Professor of Climate Science at University College London. He is a member of the Academia Europea, the chair of the European Science Foundation's European Space Science Committee, a member of the European Space Agency's Director General's High Level Advisory Group on Human Space Exploration for Europe, he also is the patron of the Surrey Climate Commission and a member of the UK Parliament and Scientific Com Committee. Chris Rapley has an MA in Honours Physics from Oxford University, a Master of Science in Radio Astronomy from the University of Manchester, a PhD in X-ray Astronomy from the University of London, and some honorary degrees and honorary professorships. His previous posts include, he was uh, recently director of the Science Museum, director of the British Antarctic Survey, chairman of the London Climate Change Partnership, and president of the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research. He has also been distinguished visiting scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Chris Rapley spent the first 25 years of his career as a space scientist developing instruments to study the soft X-ray sky solar flares, and in particular the Earth's polar regions and land-based water bodies. More recently, he has focused on the role of climate scientists in delivering value to society through decision-making, public policy, and more effective communication. This is interesting. Um, maybe Chris Rapley will tell us about that. In 2014, he and the playwright Duncan McMillian wrote a play. It's called 2071, 2071, uh, which Professor Rapley performed at the Royal Court Theatre and in Hamburg and Brussels. Uh, the script is available in paperback and was published by John Murray. In 2003, Professor Rapley was appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire of Her Majesty the Queen. And in 2008, he was awarded the Edinburgh Science Medal for having made a significant contribution to the understanding and well being of humanity. Um, welcome, Dr. Chris Rapley. I'm very glad to have you here in our class. And um, I think we're all looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Sandra. Um, and uh, hello, everybody. Good to see you all. And uh, I hope you uh, uh, enjoy and benefit from the uh, the next couple of hours. So I'm, I'm going to start by sharing uh, my presentation. And can I just check with Sandra that you can see that OK? Yes, it looks OK. Good, good. All right, well, uh, as Sandra said, I, I called this talk Climate Change, Finding the Agency to Act. Um, we supposedly make about 30,000 decisions a day, each of us, uh, from the kind of trivial, you know, about what clothes to wear, uh, you know, what to have for breakfast, uh, through to if we're um, in senior positions, uh, decisions that can affect the future of the planet. Um, and one of the issues with climate change is that the, the science community over the last uh, 40, 50 years, uh, and increasingly over the last uh, decade or so, has put huge amounts of effort into understanding the nature of the problem. 
Uh, and and that all derives from what we would call the natural sciences, you know, the, phys the, the physicists, the, the chemists, the biologists, the climatologists, the polar specialists and so on. Um, but of course, what really matters is um, decisions that are made round tables like in this cartoon that will actually define uh, what the future of the, uh, of the planet and society will look like. So that's what I've become interested in. And that's the journey that we'll go on over the next uh, hour or so uh, as I take you through the, the, the story of, of climate change. I mean, arguably the greatest drama uh, that humanity has engaged in. Um, with as yet blank pages um, for the future, which we can all sit down and write. So uh, some of you may have seen reports during the summer when if you, if you think back, um, Europe and other places in the world, as we'll see, suffered very extreme droughts, uh, which reduced uh, water levels, river levels, and so on. And in, in many parts of Europe, revealed rocks in which were carved messages from the past. Uh, and, and these rocks are known as hunger stones and the message in this case uh, from um, the Elbe River uh, is, uh, if you can see me weep. Uh, because in the past, in, you know, back as far as the 15th century, uh, strong events in the, in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, um, River levels this low were associated with extreme droughts and crop failures and uh, uh, severe hunger, starvation. So uh, what we witnessed uh, in July of this year was by any standards an extreme event. Um, but if, if we look around Europe and then around the world, this is an image of the Rhine, which of course is a, a hugely important transport artery uh, which was disrupted because the vessels were finding it difficult to navigate in some places, impossible to navigate the shallow waters. Uh, this is the Danube uh, in Budapest. Uh, this is a tributary of the Loire in France. This is Lake Oroville in California. This is the Piranha River, uh, South America's second longest river. It drops It goes all the way from uh, Paraguay down through uh, Brazil and Argentina. Um, similarly in South Asia and in China. This is uh, Poing Lake in China, and this is uh, the Jialing River in Chongqing in China. So around the world, um, these extreme droughts and very much lowered water levels uh, were, were synchronous. And if we look at the temperature data, um, these, uh, this summary of meteorological data in Europe, uh, it wasn't just that there was an extended and extreme drought, but there were um, incredible um, record temperatures, records being broken routinely over a period of, of several weeks. But it's really not normal for temperatures uh, in Europe to get much beyond the, the 40s, and yet they became quite commonplace. And pretty much at the same time, you're seeing even more dramatic temperatures uh, all over uh, China and Mongolia and Southeast Asia. And if we back away, uh, this is a, a satellite image from uh, geostationary orbit. Um, the, these, uh, this band of hot temperature uh, girdled the earth. And, and in this particular case, uh, you know, a temperature of nearly 54 degrees centigrade in Iran. So something really strange was happening. And this was picked up, this, this sort of drumbeat of messages from the planet uh, was picked up by the, by the media, cut through the media. And um, it was difficult for anybody who uh, either listened to the radio or watched TV or read a newspaper or looked at social media um, to miss the fact that something dramatic was happening. So headlines like the world rivers and canals and reservoirs turning to dust, Colorado River drought, uh, first climate disaster, uh, dangerous heat wave engulfs China, US, and Europe. Heat wave in China is the most severe ever recorded. So, at the same time, there were huge and devastating floods, particularly in Pakistan, but not just in Pakistan. So, uh, and I mean, this was really serious. Pakistan, a, a, a large area of the country, is fairly low lying. 
And uh, over a thousand people were, were killed, millions were displaced. The country still hasn't recovered. Um, of course, uh, not only people were displaced, but waterborne diseases uh, uh, spread. So this was pretty catastrophic. Uh, they called it a monsoon on steroids. But again, it wasn't just in Pakistan or Southeast Asia. Uh, similar uh, massive flooding occurred around the world. So you ask yourself, well, wait a minute, how can we simultaneously have extreme drought and extreme floods? Let me just show you how extreme the flooding is. This is a, a clip from social media of, uh, of the flooding in, in Pakistan. And you, one tends to think of, uh, of flooding as being just an inundation, a gentle inundation of uh, deep water. Uh, but in a hilly country, in a country with um, strong gradients, the water can um, mobilize uh, a torrents of rock, uh, which just shower down into uh, built up areas like bulldozers and, and demolished buildings and, and, of course, do huge damage to the infrastructure. So you ask yourself, well, well, how could this happen? And it turns out that um, uh, 19th century physics has the answer. You know, how can you have both uh, extreme dry and extreme wet? Well, if you warm the atmosphere, it can carry an additional 7% of moisture vapor for every degree centigrade of warming. And so this does two things. It makes the atmosphere much more efficient at drawing water out of the soils and vegetations in areas that are drying. So it makes their dryness more extreme, and hence you get these um, uh, extreme droughts. Uh, but that additional water is carried, is wafted uh, by the winds to places uh, over the surface where, they, where the warm air either meets cold air or it's lifted up over mountains and, and then cools. And when it deposits that moisture as rain, it does so in much more intensive uh, events. And so a little bit of 19th century physics explains these two coincident phenomena. That is a combination of extreme droughts and extreme flooding. Now, I don't know if uh, any of you have come across this before, but a colleague of mine uh, from Reading University um, came up with a way of characterizing the warming that the planet has experienced over the last hundred years by using these color stripes. So each color, each band is, uh, each vertical band uh, covers a, a particular period running back over the last hundred years, so sort of years by year. And uh, blue represents uh, cool, uh, uh, this is where the planet was, uh, before we uh, the impacts of industrialization hit it. And what you see is you move from left to right, you come forward in time to the present, and the stripes get hotter and hotter, they get warmer and warmer. So these color stripes, uh, the temperature stripes, give you a, a vivid uh, visualization of how the planet has warmed, particularly in the last 30 to 40 years. But of course, there's no temperature scale and no time scale. So the other thing that uh, Ed has done is he's produced this clock. Uh, let, let me just take it back and explain this. So this clock doesn't have hours around it. It has the months of the year. In the center where it started was the average temperature during the 19th century globally. And year by year, what you see happening is the uh, time running on um, and the global temperature getting warmer and warmer until uh, very recently, it gets close to these circles, the 1.5 degree circle and the two degree circle, which many of you will uh, be aware are the uh, limits set uh, in the Conference of the Parties, uh, the, the uh, meeting of the United Nations countries uh, in Paris in 2015, where uh, it was uh, agreed that allowing the planet to warm significantly more than 1.5 degrees uh, was unwise and dangerous, and that certainly we should try and limit warming to two degrees. So what Ed's spiral shows is that um, although initially uh, starting in the, 19, in the 18th, 19th century and the early 20th century, we were well away from those limits, um, that particularly over this last uh, 30, 40, 50 years, the period of the so-called Great Acceleration, we've come perilously close uh, to violating that limit. Now, of course, if you warm the planet, 
um, things happen. Um, and one of the things that happens is that uh, any ice and snow that is near the melting point will uh, shift from being a solid uh, to being a liquid. And so this image, um, which is built up, uh, it's a composite from a whole series of satellite images, is looking down towards the North Pole. You can see uh, Canada, Greenland, and over in the background there, you can just about make out Scandinavia and then running all the way around um, you know, Russia and Siberia. So we're looking at the Arctic Ocean. And the white and gray colors represent floating sea ice, so the frozen crust of the ocean. Um, and the lighter colors represent quite thick ice. So if you look at the little histogram, the little chart down in the bottom right, it shows that the bright white colors represent ice uh, that has an age of five years or more. So it survived five uh, summers and would have been um, about five meters, maybe seven meters thick. Um, and that in addition, as, as you get towards the uh, more coastal areas, uh, there's thinner ice uh, and indeed uh, running down the left-hand side of, or the western side of Greenland and a little bit down the um, eastern side of it, there's um, uh, ice that is only one year old and therefore quite thin, a meter or so. Um, and the thing about this ice is that it, it forms a cap that isolates the ocean from the atmosphere and so it prevents exchanges of heat and moisture and momentum between the ocean and the atmosphere. So it performs a really uh, important uh, geophysical function. And so what we're going to see, this first image starts in January 1984, uh, so in, in the winter. And what we'll do is we'll let the... Um, let the sequence run forward to a few years ago, and it runs very quickly. So you see the kind of heartbeat of the seasons as the Arctic becomes bathed in sunlight during the summer and some of this ice melts, and then it refreezes in the winter. And you will also see the motion of the ice as some of it is pumped out, particularly down the eastern side of Greenland. But uh, watch it and look at what happens to the color scale. So you see it's very fluid. Uh, we're, we're watching now uh, 1993, 94, 95, 97, 98. And you can see a couple of things happening. First of all, the amount of very thick ice is being much reduced. And in the summer, it's clicking between the two now, um, the area of ocean which is exposed where the ice has melted away completely and where the ocean and atmosphere connect has very significantly increased. And if you look at the histogram now at the bottom, the uh, uh, amount of old ice has reduced from about 30% to a few percent. Um, and the amount of thin ice has increased dramatically. So um, the earth is responding uh, even in these northern latitudes. Um, and because this has allowed the ocean and atmosphere to couple in and, and exchange heat and moisture in ways that they did not previously. This has had an impact on the whole of the uh, ocean atmosphere system in these latitudes, which has fed down into mid latitudes. It's changed the way the jet stream operates, it's changed the temperature differential between the pole and the equator. And so what has happened in the Arctic hasn't stayed in the Arctic, it's had implications for weather across Europe, across Northern uh, America, uh, and, and across uh, Eurasia. Down in the Antarctic, we have a completely different geographical setup. Instead of uh, an ocean surrounded by land, we have a large continent surrounded completely by ocean. Um, and with a huge block of ice sitting on the land, uh, up to four kilometers thick in the middle, uh, if all of it were to melt, it would uh, raise sea level by 70 metres. Um, and what's been happening there is the colour scale shows uh, that around the coastal regions, particularly in what's called West Antarctica here, uh, but also in East Antarctica, um, uh, ice has been uh, lost. That is, the uh, glaciers have been accelerating and the conveyor belt of ice from the, uh, the ice dome, the huge ice sheet, into the ocean has accelerated uh, with significant ice loss. And so Antarctica is uh, dumping ice into the ocean. 
Um, this has happened because the ocean beneath the ice shelves that um, float around these uh, coastlines, the ocean has warmed, the ice shelves have uh, been damaged, they've collapsed. Their removal has removed uh, effectively a cork from a bottle and those glaciers have accelerated. Um, and that's led uh, along with melting in Greenland, melting and ice loss in Greenland and in glaciers around the world to an acceleration in sea level rise. So up until a couple of hundred years ago, certainly for um, two millennia previously, sea level had been pretty stable following its rise after the last um, transition from the last ice age. Um, but these data have been taken during the satellite era from uh, uh, advanced radars that orbit the Earth and measure the height of the ocean surface. And during the period, uh, just uh, the last decade of the last millennium, sea level was rising at a couple of millimetres a year. Uh, in the early part of this millennium, it was rising at three millimetres a year. And more recently, it's been rising at about four millimetres a year. Uh, or 44 um, centimeters, or four centimeters, a, sorry, 44 centimeters a century. Uh, and this is significant because during the transition from the last ice age to the pre present, sea level rose at about a meter per century. So in less than 100 years, both as a result of the warming of the ocean, which causes it to expand, uh, and the loss of ice uh, on land, uh, we've kicked off. Um, a, a geologically significant rate of sea level rise. So I was talking about what was happening um, in the summer, and then uh, you look back a little bit further. Um, but just to remind you that we're still seeing very strange uh, temperatures, certainly in Europe. Uh, this was taken, what, it was the 14th today, so this is from a couple of days ago. Uh, you can see the colour chart here shows that over continental Europe, we're seeing temperatures anywhere between 5 and uh, 10, 15 degrees warmer than is normal for this time of year. Interestingly, over the United States, it's the opposite. They're seeing extremely cold temperatures. And this is, again, because the Arctic has been upset and that system is now less stable. And so it's able to spill cold air down, in this case, over the United States and Canada and at the same time draw warm air up over Europe in ways that are uh, extremely unusual. So what's going on here? What, what, what's happening here? Well, um, we, we have upset. I'm a physicist, and so I like to um, uh, get to the, the, the kind of underlying principles of what's going on here. Uh, and basically, human beings have upset the energy balance of the planet. And, and you all know the story of how this has been done. I'll come on to it in a minute. Um, but this satellite image of the planet is not taken in the optical, which we're familiar with. Uh, we see beautiful pictures of the blue planet um, you know, all the time. But this is taken in the thermal infrared. So we're looking at the heat radiation, which is escaping from the planet um, uh, into the cosmos, into the darkness of space. And the darker areas are actually warm, it's a negative image, and the lighter areas, the cool. Um, and what's happening here is that the, the um, heat that's escaping to the camera is coming from quite high up in the atmosphere. If you look in the dark areas, which we would call in the optical, the clear atmosphere, you can't actually see the surface. And this is a direct demonstration of the greenhouse effect, the fact that these very small uh, quantities of carbon dioxide, water vapor, uh, and methane, and a few other gases in the atmosphere, tiny percentages, make the atmosphere opaque uh, in these thermal infrared temperatures. And so the heat that's coming up from the surface is, um, is absorbed and re-radiated several times before it finally reaches a point high enough in the atmosphere where it can escape to space. And, and indeed, some of the heat is carried up through the atmosphere by convection rather than by radiation. And what the planet is trying to do is to balance the amount of heat that it's gathering, intercepting from the sun in the form of sunlight and heat, um, which then drive the motions of the ocean and atmosphere and, uh, and drive the biosphere. Uh, but are then radiated away into space, what it's trying to do is achieve a balance between the outgoing energy and the incoming energy. 
And by continuously adding more and more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, we have upset that balance. And so the planet is currently out of balance. As we speak, it's gathering heat, enormous amounts of heat, uh, something like 20 times the amount of heat that all of humanity generates every day to run the modern world, to power the modern world. Um, it's the equivalent of every person on the planet, all 8 billion people, having 40 one and a half kilowatt kettles pouring hot water continuously into the ocean, which is not a bad metaphor because most of that heat does go into the ocean. Um, and un until we stop adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and allow the planet to um, warm up a little bit more and gain equilibrium, uh, then it will continue to be out of balance and continue to accumulate energy. Um, now, this is a slice through a core of ice uh, that was drilled in the Antarctic. Now, I mentioned that the Antarctic ice sheet is four kilometers thick. And of course, the, uh, the snow uh, is laid down year by year by a very fine rain of, uh, of, of snow and crystals uh, from the uh, Antarctic atmosphere. And as the ice and snow builds up, it compresses uh, the ice beneath it and traps uh, samples of air in the bubbles that you can see in this slice. So if you drill down through the Antarctic ice sheet, you go backwards in time. You can do the same in Greenland. You can do the same in any ice body. But you go backwards in time. And the ice sheet is sufficiently thick that you can go back nearly a million years. In fact, as we speak, um, uh, attempts uh, being made to drill in a new place in Antarctica that will take us back a million years. Uh, up until now, the furthest we've gone back is 850,000 years. So nature has very kindly taken samples of the atmosphere over this long period. And, and here's a, uh, um, a kind of slice, a vertical slice uh, through an ice core. And, and what I'm showing here is the trace of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere over that 850,000 years. So here are the scales. The, the, we are on the right. The present uh, day is on the right. 800,000 years is back to the left. And what you can see is that there's this sort of sawtooth um, behavior over that time. What's interesting is that if we superimposed on the carbon dioxide trace, the temperature trace, and, and from these bubbles, one can estimate uh, global temperatures, uh, they match almost perfectly. So this is the ice age cycle, eight ice age cycles over the last um, 800,000 years. Each cycle has a period of about 100,000 years. And what we see is that in a cold period at the bottom, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is about 180 units. And in the warm period, when the planet is about five degrees warmer and the ice sheets retreat, um, it's about 280 units. So the variation between an ice age and an interglacial over this 100,000 year cycle is about 100 units. This is where um, the uh, uh, carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere is now. I checked on the internet yesterday and the global average a um, couple of days ago is 418 units. Remember that the natural maximum at which the planet uh, rests, uh, sort of settles out, is 280. So in the last 100 years, by adding um, by burning fossil fuels, we've added sufficient carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to raise the concentration uh, by more than the amount that the planet normally um, oscillates uh, between an ice age and an interglacial when the global temperature changes by about five degrees and massive ice sheets grow and, and retreat, particularly in the northern hemisphere. So at a rate uh, kind of 100 times um, uh, faster than the natural cycle, uh, we've done something pretty dramatic. So as the energy accumulates, uh, the world warms. As we've seen, ice and snow melt. Sea levels rise because the ocean expands as it warms. Remember, most of that heat is going into the ocean. 94% um, of it is going into the ocean, 2% into the ice, 2% into the atmosphere, 2% into the land, plus the uh, water from um, and, and ice from uh, ice sheets on land, glaciers. Ocean and atmosphere circulation patterns change because the temperature 
gradient between the equator and the pole changes, and that gradient is what drives the circulation of, of the fluids. I've mentioned the water cycle accelerates because uh, for every degree centigrade, you can carry 7% more water. Uh, extreme weather events increase, ecosystems respond, food and water supplies are affected, infrastructure is damaged or requires upgrading because it will have been designed either by architects or engineers uh, to withstand the climate um, uh, characteristics that uh, were prevalent at the time of the design. So the, the climate we inherited rather than the one we're provoking. Uh, and people and species are impacted and economic and political stability are affected. So I've made this sound like it's a, a kind of linear cascade, but it's not. Um, all of these different uh, consequences feed back on each other in complicated uh, and nonlinear ways. Um, and so it's very difficult um, to, uh, for humans to be able to understand quite how this is all going to work out, because this is the uh, most complex of all complex systems. Um, and in the long history of evolution, uh, the human brain has developed to think in terms of cause and effect. You know, something moves, well, something must have pushed it. A ball moves, we must have kicked it. If you kick a ball, it will move. Uh, so we tend to think in terms of linear cause and effect, but linear cause and effect is, is uh, wrapped up in very complicated ways in these complex feedback systems. And the human brain hasn't evolved to be able to intuitively understand how these things work. In fact, they're highly counterintuitive. So evolutionary processes have not given us the mental ability to interpret properly the dynamic behavior of these complex systems in which we're now embedded. And the, the, this quote comes from uh, an American researcher, Jay Forrester, who back in the 1970s, in the very, very early days of uh, digital computing, realized that the, the tool that we are uh, increasingly have access to that helps us try and understand these complex systems better than our brain is the digital computer. And indeed, he worked with others uh, in on the limits to growth uh, exercise, a uh, very famous book published first in 1972. And he developed this digital model of the, of the Earth system and used it to predict a whole load of social and other um, um, uh, traces into the future. Um, and at the time, this is one of the first attempts to use digital computers to understand these complex systems. And of course, they've been a tool for understanding the climate system uh, in ever more sophisticated ways ever since. So it's um, as the world warms, uh, there are all of these consequences. And I put together these panels just to illustrate them. So on the top left, surface melting in Greenland. I mean, these aren't small puddles that you wade around in Wellington boots. These are huge rivers of meltwater that find cracks in the ice, force their way down those cracks a kilometer or so in this case to the base of the ice sheet where they lubricate the flow of the ice sheet uh, towards the coast and hence the uh, delivery of ice to the ocean. Uh, the second panel showing that in the tundra, the Arctic tundra, uh, there's lots of methane uh, locked up, frozen into the tundra. And as the tundra begins to melt, uh, the methane escapes and can be ignited. Uh, more intense storms, the eye of Hurricane Dorian, photographed from the International Space Station, uh, the, the, the winds circulating around the eye of the storm were you know, a couple of 100 mile an hour winds. And you can see the devastation of those winds in, uh, in the Bahamas, Grand Albaco and Abaco. And, it, and, and it, often you hear those who are skeptical about climate change say, well, human beings will adapt um, well, you know, tell that to the residents who used to live in those structures. Um, you know, four years on, they still haven't recovered. Uh, over on the left in the middle is one of the residents escaping not, uh, before the winds hit, um, but dealing with the storm surge that the, uh, the tornado, uh, uh, the hurricane generated um, as it approached the, the land. And, and then other um, panels showing uh, wildfires, coastal erosion, the buckling of rails to illustrate impacts on infrastructure. 
uh, uh, an image of a French nuclear power station, which of many was shut down this summer because the cooling water was too warm uh, from the river system to cool the reactors, uh, people losing their homes and migration, which we'll come back to. So there are a whole uh, complex range of consequences uh, for human beings. But I just want to pick on this one uh, to illustrate something that uh, the climate science community has been able to predict general consequences, but the specific consequences uh, eluded people. So who would ever have known? It certainly was not predicted uh, five years ago that Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E, who are the uh, utility uh, that provides gas and electricity to essentially most of the residents in California, the richest state of the richest country in the world, uh, that they should have had to sue for Chapter 11 bankruptcy uh, because faulty overhead lines that they had not maintained satisfactorily set uh, light to uh, forests uh, during the wildfire season and caused tens of billions of dollars worth of damage to properties and businesses, uh, as well as many people losing their lives. Um, and so class action against that uh, company that provides electricity and gas power to California uh, has caused them to go bankrupt. And, and so the, the, the social consequences of climate change are still unfolding before our eyes. And this chart tries to summarize um, the billion dollar weather and climate disasters in the United States alone last year. Uh, I won't take you through them, you can look this up on the web. Um, but whereas 10 or 15 years ago, the people who were most engaged with uh, the story of climate change were the climate scientists, now the politicians and the insurance uh, companies uh, and the pension funds and the um, institutions responsible for public and uh, private infrastructure are beginning to take this very seriously. Um, just from earlier this week, uh, this little clip. Making landfall along Florida's east coast as a category one storm, but quickly weakened to a tropical storm. At least 45 of Florida's 67 counties are under a state of emergency and video continuing to come in showing damage like this. Homes in the Daytona Beach area dangling over the edge of a cliff on the verge of collapsing. For more, let's bring in Daytona Beach Shores Mayor Nancy Miller. Nancy, we just saw those homes uh, right, falling right into the ocean. You're at the city's public safety department. Give us an update. What's the latest? Well, as of today, Kira, we now have 18 properties that we have deemed unsafe. So that what that means to us that we have used all of our public safety officers as well as loans from our sheriff department to go in condo by condo, building by building to make sure that there was no one occupying those buildings. So um, she goes on to say that... Um, People in her department who've been there for 30, 40 years, never seen anything like it, which is a common statement. The reason it's important is that uh, even though it was only 18 or 19 properties that were severely damaged, the impact on the public services uh, in Daytona Beach uh, were, were uh, massive. They had to deploy uh, people in ways that uh, prevented them from doing other things. So whereas in the past climate change in the public mind tended to be seen as something that would happen in the future to other people somewhere else on the planet. It's now becoming real. It's becoming a real part of everybody's life. So again, just some other uh, issues here. Heat waves uh, estimated to have already cost the global economy 16 trillion. I'll give you an example. This is a map of temperature, global temperature averaged over the year. Um, but it's not uh, normal temperature, dry bulb temperature. This is wet bulb temperature, which, as some of you will know, is, is very relevant to human beings. This is the temperature you measure with a thermometer that's wrapped up in a, in a damp cloth, which is um, evaporating water and therefore cooling the uh, thermometer. And that's exactly what the human body does. Uh, we, we, uh, as we live our lives, we're generating about 100 watts of heat. Um, we need to radiate and uh, rid ourselves of that heat or it uh, 
uh, overcomes our uh, temperature control system and we get serious uh, organ damage and die. Um, and so we sweat away a lot of that heat. Um, and if the wet bulb temperature gets to 35, 36 degrees is the traditional uh, statement, um, then it becomes impossible for a human to do that. And, and it's hugely dangerous. Exposed to that sort of wet bulb temperature for more than a few hours can be lethal. And so you need to be able to retreat into an air-conditioned building or a, or a tunnel or a cave or something. So um, the way things are at present is that for most of the time, most of the planet is reasonably well away from that uh, critical threshold. Um, but some modeling done a couple of years ago showed that in extremists, and, and this is uh, it is an extreme scenario. It does it makes some strong assumptions about humans not addressing carbon emissions and so on in a rather dramatic way. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is quite physically feasible. It's not impossible that this could happen. This is where we could be towards the end of the century with vast tracts of the planet well at these uh, serious limits where um, those regions are uninhabitable. And of course, you'll notice that although Africa may not be that occupied and perhaps the um, Amazon rainforest, other areas within this zone are heavily uh, habited and uh, would essentially affect billions of people. Um, now, that, that, when that was first published, um, the climate science community was very cautious about it. It was seen as a answer to the question, what is the absolute worst that could happen, even if it's extremely unlikely, useful to know, but, but uh, not necessarily worth planning for. But since then, uh, the, there's been quite a lot of work done on the future of what's called the human climate niche, the emergence of heat and humidity too severe, uh, summer's becoming too hot for humans. Um, and uh, more recently, some work done on just checking what the wet bulb temperature uh, environment humans really fit humans really can tolerate and and in fact the the threshold is is not 35 degrees but actually it's 32 degrees or thereabouts anything much beyond that is becoming significant for humans uh, in the night time when you're sleeping if the temperature in your building doesn't drop below 25 degrees that's also problematical because the body can't reset itself to cope with heat the next day and so extreme heat is becoming a major issue. And if we go back to this summer, uh, I'd just show you again the situation that vast tracts of the planet were um, exposed to uh, blistering heat, uh, 50 degrees or thereabouts in uh, India, a um, 100 times more likely as a result of climate change than if we had left the uh, atmosphere alone. And for those of you that may have read this uh, fictional book, uh, The Ministry for the Future, um, it's uh, slightly um, upsetting because the initial chapter of this book, which is, is fiction, as I say, but nevertheless, it describes an extreme heat wave in India and Pakistan, which essentially was played out uh, in the summer. So um, uh, uh, reality um, becoming um, uh, following fiction. Now, of course, if, if, if areas become uninhabitable, either through extreme heat or drought, crop failures or inundation by rising sea levels or floods, um, then people will be displaced. And this image um, is from, uh, uh, from Damascus um, in Syria. Uh, the, the people that were displaced into the suburban areas where we know the terrible tragedy has been unfolding for some years now, were partly driven there by the effect of three years of extreme drought around about 2010, but also by the impact of the Iraq war, which displaced a couple of million people. So, you know, humans are perfectly capable of, uh, of displacing people uh, without climate change. But nevertheless, climate change was a factor because that drought was an extremely unusual drought and is attributed uh, as an extreme uh, to having been made more probable by climate change. So migration, um, which of course has been a huge issue um, across the Mediterranean in particular and into Europe, um, is one of the consequences um, of climate change. I'm not saying that it is driven by climate change, but climate change is a threat multiplier. 
And this image shows uh, uh, some of those migrants arriving at the borders of the European Union, actually in Hungary, uh, where they were held um, uh, by, uh, by fences um, and then dealt with. But as you know, dealing with that uh, influx of, uh, of, of perfectly legal migrants escaping from desperate situations uh, destabilized European politics. And in particular, um, it was a major factor in the UK's decision uh, to exit Europe through Brexit. Um, and so for anybody who thinks that they have not been affected by climate change, uh, particularly in the UK, because they've not yet suffered uh, serious effects from a heat wave or, or flooding, many have, but many haven't, uh, everybody is already feeling the effects uh, because political stability has already uh, suffered as a result of climate change. Now, um, what the climate science community has also discovered is that in this hugely complex system with feedbacks in it, you can push it and push it and push it inc incrementally, adding more and more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere each year, and it will respond incrementally um, until, like any complex system, it will reach a point where it's capable of suddenly uh, reorganizing itself in a nonlinear way. And uh, the climate science community has identified a number of what are called tipping points in the uh, climate system. So the irreversible loss of the Greenland ice sheet, the loss of Arctic summer ice, you, you saw that in the little animation, uh, the loss of coral reefs, loss of West Antarctica. The color code here uh, shown in the little table shows the uh, approximate threshold where these irreversible changes would be kicked off. So some in the one to three degree range, others at slightly higher temperatures. Uh, and indeed, the, the climate change, climate science community has been lowering its estimates of where those thresholds are. But nevertheless, um, it's quite possible that we are already on the verge of pushing through some of these tipping points. And unfortunately, they're all connected. So it's like a set of dominoes. Once you get one going, uh, it can lead to the others tumbling. And so it's, it's like a giant Jenga game. We're one by one removing um, bricks of stability in the climate system, which has been amazingly and unusually and uh, inexplicably uh, 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 stable over the, since the last ice age, over the last 10,000 years. Um, and so by our actions, we're removing those bricks um, and we're in danger of losing control. At present, we still have our hands on the volume knob of the um, greenhouse gases and hence the energy imbalance. Um, but if we're not careful, we'll go through those thresholds. And then the laws of physics and, uh, and uh, chemistry and biology and um, planetary science will take over and the climate system will head off uh, to uh, wherever those natural laws take it. And although we will still have some control over just how bad things get, um, we will have lost the key piece of control. Now, this isn't a new thought. Uh, this is a quote from uh, nearly 20 years ago. The work was done 20 years ago. The US Department of Defense saying, rising global temperatures, changing precipitation patterns, climbing sea levels, and more extreme weather events will intensify the challenges of global instability, hunger, poverty, and conflict. All that's changed in the last uh, decade is the um, is the verb we've gone from the future to the present? But we um, it said will and uh, it's uh, the, these are intensifying these things. So we know what we need to do. We need to leave. Uh, we need to stop uh, emitting uh, well, burning fossil fuel and emitting carbon dioxide in particular, but methane also. And it's estimated that we need to leave ninety percent of uh, known coal uh, coal reserves. 60% of oil reserves and 60% of gas reserves, we need to leave them in the ground. And you hear a lot about the, uh, the term net zero, where you don't leave them all in the ground, but you compensate in some magical way by drawing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere whilst you're still releasing some. Um, I, I'm not convinced by that. And so the top panel here illustrates uh, the emancipation of slaves, the, uh, the um, abolition of slavery uh, at the end of the uh, 18th and beginning of the 19th century. And the abolitionists didn't say, well, by 1820, we'll reduce slavery by 50 percent. 
um, and uh, 30 years later will offset any residual slavery by prayer or good works. They said slavery is an abomination and we will abolish it. Uh, similarly, uh, the women's vote, women's emancipation was for all women to have the vote. The civil rights movement in the United States was for all uh, peoples to have equal rights. Um, and we see a movement in the uh, climate space of people saying that there needs to be justice for all inhabitants of the planet in terms of dealing with climate change. And of course, Greta Thunberg has done a great job in mobilizing the school children of the world. And what we should all be seeking is to abolish fossil fuels. So that is, uh, if you remember nothing else from this talk, that's a key message. How are we doing? Well, these are some headlines triggered, of course, by the um, Conference of the Parties, COP27, which is going on right now. Uh, oil and gas firms are not planning on keeping those known reserves in the ground. They're, they're actually searching for more uh, reserves um, and at the same time pretending in many cases to be adopting green policies, but not doing so. Um, interestingly, the world's car manufacturers are planning to uh, manufacture uh, 400 million more diesel and petrol cars than could possibly uh, keep us within those 1.5 to 2 degree boundaries that were set uh, uh, seven years ago. So they're assuming that the fossil fuels will be available in order to operate those cars. That's despite the rapid growth in electric cars. Um, and we just uh, heard a couple of days ago that carbon emissions are far from turning over and flattening out and reducing, but they've hit a new high um, uh, this year. So I was in Paris at the Conference of the Parties in 2015, and it was an amazing experience. It was a diplomatic triumph. After decades of the nations of the world arguing about whether climate change really should be taken seriously, they decided, yes, it should. The, the scientific evidence was overwhelming. Um, and they agreed the common goal to hold temperatures to well below two degrees uh, relative to pre-industrial and to try and limit to 1.5. And uh, they put together a collective plan to cut anthropogenic, anthropogenic emissions and achieve a balance um, in uh, the middle of the century. That's this uh, net zero, which uh, uh, I think should be even more extreme. Since then, the science community has come out, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, with yet more scientific evidence, if you needed it, uh, that it's unequivocal that human influence is, is uh, behind all of this, um, and that we had better do something about it quickly, or we're going to go through the 1.5 degree limit, uh, unless we uh, instigate immediate and deep emissions cuts. And Antonio Guterres has tried to, in a, in, a, in a world in which political slogans seem to have more power than uh, uh, empirical evidence, um, uh, uh, Antonio Guterres summarized this by saying, this is code red for humanity. Uh, that was a year ago, uh, two more reports just uh, in the last week or so, uh, continue the story saying it's not getting better, it's getting worse. And again, this is cutting through into the media. Uh, the threshold is slipping away, the window is closing fast. There is no credible pathway to 1.5 degrees in place, uh, red alerts and so on. So uh, as we speak, uh, the nations of the world are wrangling over this uh, in Sharm El Sheikh. Uh, we don't know what the outcome will be, um, but on the basis of uh, what we already know has happened and has not happened since Paris, um, one wouldn't hold one's breath. Um, that uh, the the really uh, intensive uh, in, um, interventions that are needed uh, will happen. And so where are we? This uh, thermometer shows uh, where the planet uh, may be at the end of the century. Uh, remember that the, um, the range agreed in Paris is 1.5 to 2 degrees, shown by the little uh, red uh, range of arrows on the left. This is where we were pre-industrial. This is where we are now at 1.2 degrees of warming. And those various uh, colored bars on the right show where we're heading based on different assumptions, the, the policies and actions that have already been committed to, the targets that have been set by different nations, the pledges, an optimistic scenario. 
But by and large, um, we'll wait and see what emerges at the end of this week. Um, but it looks like we're heading beyond two degrees uh, to something like 2.5, 2.7. And, and remember, of course, that this is a best estimate. Um, this is a probability distribution. If we're lucky, it could be uh, cooler. Uh, if we're unlucky, it could be warmer. So um, if you're a human being and if you've been listening, um, then it's almost certain that um, knowingly, uh, but not wishing to do so, nevertheless, it's difficult to tell this story without generating within one's audience uh, dark and unwelcome emotions of anxiety, fear, loss, grief, guilt, and helplessness. And I apologize for doing that. Uh, but on the other hand, um, we can't duck reality. And, and this is the true story. Um, and so at this moment, um, given that uh, um, we've been going for uh, nearly an hour, I just want you to uh, stop for a second, take a deep breath, Reflect on your reaction to the evidence that is before us. And then think about um, the question which I'm sure is occurring to many of you, is, which is, well, this is all very well, um, but what can I do about it? What can we collectively do about it? What can I do about it as an individual? So uh, take a deep breath. Um, I'm going to have a glass of water and then we'll continue with the story. OK, um, well, you heard that um, I'm very much involved and, and have been throughout my career in uh, space research and using the vantage point of space uh, initially to study the cosmos, but um, uh, more recently and, um, and even you know, decades ago uh, to study the Earth as a system. You know, the, 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 the vantage point of space is fantastic for seeing the Earth in all its um, uh, systematic glory, seeing all the parts working together. The, the Earth is blissfully unaware and indifferent to the fact that um, science has broken it up into atmosphere, oceans, and all the rest of it in order to be able to study uh, the different components. It, it operates as a united whole. And one of the best places to observe it from is space. That's not to say that we don't observe it from uh, aircraft and, uh, and the ocean as well. Um, but all of that huge investment of uh, money, time, effort, technology um, goes nowhere if what happens in eight billion of these things uh, doesn't uh, connect and doesn't take us on a path uh, into the future in which we address the problem. Um, it's worth pointing out, just, to, just out of interest, I said that the human body burns about 100 watts uh, of power um, all the time. Um, the brain takes about a fifth of that, 20% of it. Um, and so uh, it's a um, exaflop computer. Uh, it's, it, you can't really um, compare the, uh, the, the, the wetware of uh, your and my brains, the, this 1.3 kilograms of, uh, of stuff that we have in our, within our skull. You can't really compare that directly with a digital computer, but the, the computations that are going on are sort of equivalent to an exaflop computer. And it's amazing that for 1.3 kilos and 20 watts, you get a machine, um, a living machine that does something that the most powerful uh, and fastest computer in the world takes 20 megawatts of power and weighs uh, 20, 200 tons uh, to do the same. Anyway, um, nevertheless, so what, what happens inside these things will decide uh, the future trajectory of the climate system. And, and what we all know, but uh, tend to forget, is that most of those, that exaflop of computing, those 30,000 decisions that you're making each day are done completely automatically. You're not even aware of them. You can't even dig down and sample them and, and, unless you try very, very hard and then only a very limited amount of access. Uh, the, the deliberative part is the stuff that we think about, that we, we hear that little voice in our head uh, uh, rationalizing. Um, the deliberative part is tiny compared with the automatic part. And um, there are many ways this can be illustrated, but a colleague of mine, Bo Lotto, 
uh, produced this uh, nice uh, diagram uh, or picture a little while ago, and I just used it to illustrate one thing. Um, you know, here you see a scene, you recognize it, you know, it's a room, it's got a table, it's got some lights, and there's some tiles on the floor. And I want to draw your attention to those two tiles. Um, if we uh, expand them, there's one of them and there's the other. What you can see in the expanded versions is that they are exactly the same color and hue and intensity. So if I, as a, as a physical scientist, built a, an instrument to characterize those tiles, I'd be pretty disappointed if it didn't tell me that they were identical because they are identical in terms of their um, light emission as reflected or in this case transmitted light emissions because you're looking at it on a screen. But of course, in the context of the picture, they look completely different because what your brain is doing is saying, if that tile, which is under the table, uh, is not much lighter than the other one, then I would not see it in that way. So your brain, completely without you being able to control it, is giving you meaning in context. It's saying, no, 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 that tile must be physically much brighter than the other one if this image is to make sense. And you can't overrule that. It, you know, if I take you back, you know, even though you know by looking at these two patches that they are the same, you can't see them the same. You can't overrule that automatic wetware which is processing the image in your head. Now, why would evolution have done that? Why would it have equipped you with this automatic process? Well, distinguishing a light gray snake from a dark gray snake, regardless of the illumination, whether it's under the table or outside the table, is potentially an existential piece of information because one may be poisonous and one may not. And so, and, and presumably that is why your forebears and my forebears were filtered out. Those that did not have this automatic capacity got bitten by poisonous snakes or, or whatever else was the consequence of not making that distinction. And those of us that have that capacity have survived. So evolution has given us a huge amount of wetware in our heads, which is on automatically and it's delivering us meaning in context. So in this case, the visual processor is hardwired. It's always on. It's in the hidden part. It errs on the side of false positives. It tells you things that are sometimes wrong, but it's safer to do so. Um, and it works very quickly. Here's an image of uh, some kids in a, um, uh, a, a horror house somewhere in the United States. They've just been exposed to something. I don't even know what it is. But you can see all of them uh, completely involuntarily have responded to a threat. So their arms have come up to protect the chest and the heart. The mouths have opened to ingest, uh, to inhale more um, air and oxygen to uh, mobilize the um, muscular system, to energize it. The eyes have opened to widen the ability to see other associated dangers. Um, and no doubt they might have shouted as well to scare away whatever the threat might be. So the speed of reaction of this automatic software or wetware is really important too. Uh, there are many other examples of uh, both in the social world and the natural world of how we automatically respond to circumstances around us. But it led Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize, uh, winning, prize, uh, Nobel prize winning economist, to liken our, um, our brains uh, uh, to being machines for jumping to conclusions. So something happens, you know, we see something, um, um, we're introduced to something, uh, uh, we're walking through the natural world and something happens, we talk to somebody and they say something, it energizes the brain and there's a parallel response which is framed by all the factors that we see listed on the left here. So evolutionary history, uh, biological factors, genetic factors, memories and experiences, so nature and nurture, physical sensations, emotions and mood, pressures from the social environment, influences from cultural heritage. We have packed up inside our heads a set of values, a set of knowledge, a set of understanding, a set of views of the world and a set of expectations of the world. 
and something happens and these are energized and they generate a response and it's a mental sensation it's an emotional response despite the fact that academics and uh, children of the enlightenment we like to believe that our reasoning kicked in the truth is that initially on automatic it's our mental sensations that kick in perceptions associations and feelings now those can drive thoughts and in combination they can drive decisions and actions but the point that Kahneman and others are making is that because we tend to react quickly to the world around us both socially and physically because it's very important to do so to survive and uh, and prosper as often as not those mental sensations jump straight to decisions and actions and indeed in my live lectures i give people a little test i make them respond to something uh, they respond quickly and usually get it wrong um, and then i say to them if i had said to you respond to so and so think about it in other words engage the reasoning part of your brain then you would have got the right outcome but all too often um, we get the wrong outcome in, in, not often enough that it damages us i mean the, the the evolutionary brain is highly effective and for most of those 30,000 decisions we make each day um it makes either a decision that that is neither you know it, it's neutral doesn't really make a big difference to our well-being but most of the time it makes decisions which are um which help us survive and prosper it is it is uh, uh, capable though of making mistakes often those mistakes don't dam don't matter but often sometimes they do um and and so it is with climate change so for example if we're introduced to a new thought a new idea so there can't be many people on the planet who haven't been introduced to climate change but if they are that uh, reaction that uh, that uh, that uh, perception that is triggered takes you down one side of a, a, a putative pyramid or triangle where either you react negatively towards the idea being proposed or positively in this case uh, let's say this is positive so we've been introduced to climate change because of your package of genetics and learned experience it seems to make sense to you uh, it doesn't threaten you and so your initial reaction is to be favorable and then the more you're challenged on it the more you think about it the more you come up with uh, justifications to push you down to where we'll call you a believer equally somebody else who have a different world experience and worldview may think that climate change is unlikely that it's a hoax that it threatens their ability to make money or survive and so they come to the opposite conclusion um, and the only problem then is that you look across at each other and can't understand why you disagree but anyway just going through the process a pre-existing hidden association induces uh, an immediate reaction to a topic establishing an unconscious position on it if challenged step by step we self-justify the cleverer we are the better we are at doing this consolidating our position to eliminate dissonance which is uh, that unhappy feeling of feeling wrong we always want to feel right in doing so we become increasingly practiced and resolute and a thought becomes a, a belief and a conviction and you see all around us people believing things which seem to us ridiculous um, people are capable of believing almost anything through this process unfortunately that applies both to you and to me and it's almost certain that each of us believes in something which is not true hopefully uh, things that don't matter too much anyway the point of this is that uh, when one raises the issue of climate change not only do we generate those negative feelings of anxiety and helplessness that I pointed out before um, but we can also be driven into a belief set which is very unhelpful so we can be driven to believe that climate change is something that is not serious or that is wrong or that is something that we're incapable of dealing with uh, there's a whole range of uh, of unfortunate endpoints to that process and also those people around the table that we started with um, may have all sorts of institutional barriers to prevent them from taking action on climate change it may be that they are required to deliver double digit um, profits to their shareholders and anything they try and do to deal with climate change may upset that and they're required by law to deliver those uh, returns so they're stuck 
And that's what we find, that many, many people, many institutions are stuck. So I said that I um, was trained and, uh, and have followed my career as a natural scientist. Um, and so over the last uh, eight, nine years, I've strayed into a completely new area of academic uh, research and work, which is the, the world of the mind sciences. And uh, when you enter a strange territory, um, it's very useful to have uh, a good guide. And I was lucky enough uh, seven or eight years ago to uh, meet my very close colleague, uh, the neuroscientist Chris Demare. And between us, we've uh, explored this, uh, uh, this territory of the mind sciences with climate change and people being stuck in mind um, and have managed to extract from the huge body of work that um, the social sciences in general and the neurosciences and behavioral sciences in particular have generated. And we've come up with seven principles, which uh, given the pressure of time, I won't take you through in detail, but I'll simply say these principles uh, give us insight into why it is that people are stuck in the way that they are and how to help them get unstuck. You'll notice the pyramid of polarization I just spoke about is the top. Speaking to people's values, using fear is a, a very dangerous weapon. Um, but the most important thing that emerges from this uh, sifting of what's emerged from the uh, mind sciences is that it's not evidence that drives beliefs and then action, the linear model, which as children of the enlightenment, we're all taught to believe in. It's actually quite the reverse. It's actions that drive beliefs. If you do something, your self-justification engine does not want to think that you're doing something silly. And so it will find arguments and justifications for what you did, which will make you feel good and encourage you to do more. So uh, very quickly, where do we look in society to intervene uh, to make a difference? Well, it's clear that the world of politics and senior business uh, decision makers has very powerful impacts on the climate system, as do the behaviours of the general public, that's you and me, uh, uh, driven by thought leaders and their own, uh, their own ideas. So climate action, whether it's not taking an aircraft, riding a bike, eating less meat, or coming up with uh, policies and uh, laws, uh, or business decisions that reduce emissions. These are where uh, the rubber hits the road. These are where action takes place. And these two things are interlinked. The political world can't move too far ahead of the public world uh, without losing support in a democratic country, at least. And equally, the public can't move further than the law allows them to. So these two things are interconnected. So over here is the climate science community. Uh, you can open that box and there's a whole other set of stories to say in there. And through the IPCC process and similar, uh, the climate science community is quite well practiced at dealing with officials and professionals who guide the decisions of the politicians and senior business leaders. And this is happening in Sharm El Sheikh uh, while we speak. And indeed those people have sufficient knowledge of the climate system um, that it's possible to talk with them as if one were talking with one's colleagues. So the linear model can work there, not when you're talking to the uh, politicians themselves. Um, they don't have that sort of uh, insight. And so you need a different narrative approach or indeed a sloganistic approach with them. Um, similarly, with the general public, telling a story is very different from giving a lecture. And some uh, academics have a natural ability to tell a story that engages um, somebody who's a non-expert, but, but not everybody. And so one of the failures um, on the side of the climate science community has been to try and deliver to the general public the information as if they were talking to officials and professionals rather than telling a story. And, and there's a, an increasing movement amongst the academic world to learn the techniques of storytelling uh, and narrative in a way that are more effective. And then there are the other players, the media, the arts and museums and theater world, the world of law, and how one addresses those needs to be tailored to the world in which they find themselves, the way that they think, the way that they are constrained, the way that they act. 
And as I say, we know that many are stuck. They believe in climate change. They want to work on it, but they don't know what to do. And I've added architects in here um, because I'm sure there are many of you who are stuck as well. And so at UCL, we've set up this thing called the Climate Action Unit. You can look it up on the web. Our theory of change is that we look for communities of place and communities of practice so that if we're successful with one example, it can quickly propagate through that community and uh, build up exponentially and ripple through society. Um, we use our insights in carefully tailored, um, uh, facilitated um, workshops um, to get inside the heads of the people who are stuck, to introduce them to people that we believe have information that can help them, and then to help those two groups of people understand each other get to learn what questions to ask, what answers to give, and through that process develop what we call the agency to act. We liberate people, we empower them to find their own solutions to the answer, what can I do? How can I get over being stuck? And the outcomes are increased agency, a repeatable intervention that can exponentially grow through that community of place or community of practice, people who have understood the process and propagate it, and we get longer term changes throughout society. So again, you can look this up. So it's creating the agency to act. We don't know when we start this process what the outcome will be, but we are confident based on our experience now that something magical will emerge. So we have facilitated dialogue, often in very exotic uh, and unusual formats, uh, which generate um, new thinking and uh, both curiosity and inspiration. And I give you some examples where so you've dealt with Chatham House, the um, uh, very powerful think tank within the UK. We've dealt with uh, uh, parliamentarians in the House of Lords and in the House of Commons. We've worked with local government. We've worked with the Welsh government, the, the devolved authority in Wales. We produced a risk handbook, a communicating risk handbook for the previous uh, a conference of the parties, and we've developed a policy pathways training course which we can run and which we do run routinely on the web. And there are many other examples. So that really brings me to the end. We started with that group of people sitting around a table um, trying to make a decision, uh, asking the question, how does that move us forward? Um, and in your case, it'll be something to do with, you know, how do I design a building um, or a, a piece of um, uh, infrastructure um, that will be future-proof um, and also uh, reduce emissions so that the world will have a more benign climate than otherwise. Um, and using this process of understanding uh, these key concepts from the mind sciences, uh, we can make sure that that happens. But always, when any decision is made, what one needs to stop and ask that question, how does that move us forward? And it needs to be answered in green, not red, um, because green is the color of hope. And what we're finding is that by these interventions, it's really raising our hopes um, that we can make things better than they would otherwise be. Um, so that was a bit of a, uh, a long story. Um, I hope you survived, and I'm very happy now to take, um, take questions. Thank you very much, Chris Rapley. Uh, we have quite a few questions in the chat. Okay. So I would ask the students to ask the questions directly to you. Um, the first one was from me. Carbon uh, dioxide. Just because you showed a graph in the very beginning with the carbon dioxide going up and down over the years. And then you said something with plus 400. Does it mean it has never been as high as this? Uh, the last time there was this much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was at least 3 million years ago. Uh, we, we know that from uh, ocean sediment data. Um, and if we go back 30 million years, we get to a period where the, the um, planet was so warm that there were no ice sheets, there was no ice. So over from 30 million years ago to about 3 million years ago, the carbon dioxide content reduced, got down to about um, 500, 400 parts per million, so roughly where we are now. 
Um, and that's when we entered um, this Ice Age cycle. Initially, the Ice Age is uh, uh, waxed and waned with a 40,000 year period. But about a million years ago, that shifted to this 100,000 year period. But for three million years, um, the uh, carbon dioxide content has not been anywhere near as high as it is now. We've put that up uh, in the last 100 years. So it's a hugely dramatic signal. Um, yes, it sounds like. OK, the next question is from Heidi. Please, Heidi. Uh, yeah, it links to your question actually a bit. Um, it was also with the graph you showed about uh, the Ice Age cycle, and I wanted to ask um, if our planet will still face another ice age or if we have reached a point where this will not happen again or <laughs> i don't know yeah this 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 uh, the, the science community has looked at this um it looks like we have prevented um the next ice age um because of this uh, warming of the planet that we've induced um i should say that the ice age cycles are triggered by small wobbles um in the tilt of the planet and its precession and the shape of the orbit. The orbit becomes more elliptical and less elliptical. And this changes the way that uh, sunlight and heat are accumulated over the surface of the planet, particularly at high latitudes. And so those small changes, this rhythm uh, is what uh, has been driving the natural cycle of ice ages and interglacials. Um, and we've now pumped sufficient carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that we've completely disrupted that cycle. Now, um, it's certainly true that that cycle will continue and will sit on top of what we have done. And so over the next 100,000 years, um, it will be slightly cooler as a result of that cycle than it would have been without it. But um, we won't get uh, an, another ice age where the Northern Hemisphere is covered in a huge ice sheet uh, as it was you know, as recently as 20,000 years ago. I, I was born in the in Birmingham in the Midlands in the UK, and um, I couldn't have been born there 20,000 years ago because there was the best part of a kilometre of ice sitting over the top of it, which some people say would have been a good thing, but uh, that's if you like Birmingham or not. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mike, you are next, please. Yes, I hope you can understand me. Like I was, uh, I thought Vincent was before me, but um, yeah. Um, I asked if you know which country would be the last which is going to be affected after climate change. Like you already said that, um, of course, everyone's going to be affected because you see it from everything you are using all days, also the um, supplies. But I mean, I meant with, um, where you can really feel that it's going to be super dry or just raining a lot because we already felt it somehow also here in Germany or like in Austria and in Germany yeah. um, with this massive rain which happened and maybe there's a zone which is yeah like, it's, it, it's it's an interesting question and um, uh, I have to say nobody's ever asked me that before it's an interesting point um, the, 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 the trouble is that all nations will be affected nobody is going to escape yes um, and and i gave the example of of california um i think that the, the there has been this um uh, constant message over the decades oh well it's the poor countries that will suffer the most because they're the least able they're the least resilient they're the least able to adapt i've never been completely um convinced by that i mean obviously Ethically, it's very unfair on poor nations who haven't contributed to the problem that they suffer at all. But on the other hand, people who are able to deal with very rough circumstances may be more capable of handling the consequences than those of us that live in societies where everything is really tuned to the system that we, um, you know, we inherited. And California is rather a good point, you know, with the coastal erosion, with the wildfires, with the impact of the smoke, e e even in the areas that didn't burn down, the air quality has been so poor um, that it has been uh, affecting people's health. You've seen that it's um, caused the uh, utility to go bankrupt. So the, 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 it's all to do with these interconnections in the physical and social 
a natural system. Everything is connected to everything. And so I would find it difficult to figure out with any confidence which place on the planet, which, which country on the planet would be least affected or affected last. I think everybody is going to be affected one way or another. Yeah, I meant like more with, you were saying that there's going to be a climate change refugees, like mostly from the south, like you were show, you showed one picture where um, I saw Africa is going to be really affected. And then I was thinking about it, which country maybe would be the country where everybody tries to enter, try to stay, try to live in uh, uh, many oh, years. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Well, if you're talking about migration, Yeah. Um, then uh, if you look at that, if that heat map um, comes to pass, that is if, if it really gets to the point where across Southeast Asia, um, uh, wet bulb temperatures of 32, 33, 34 degrees become commonplace, then um, one might imagine, and I'm speculating, but one might imagine that there could be a massive migration from China into Mongolia for example, um, because Mongolia will be cooler. You know, it, it will still warm up, but it will be more tolerable than China, which is, of course, why the fact that there are boundaries, um, uh, you know, between, in this case, Russia and, uh, and China um, is, is, is so worrying because, uh, you know, as, as I pointed out, the political stability of Europe has already been um, disrupted by what is in comparison a relatively modest flux of migrants. So, um, yeah, uh, it, it, the, the migrants will try and find their way to countries that they believe are better able to manage affairs. And certainly Western Europe for the moment is very attractive compared with other countries. Um, I, I honestly think that's the best I can say because Uh, the way that this story unfolds is very dependent on what we do, um, not only by way of um, uh, um, preventing uh, climate change accelerating, but also by way of exactly the issue which is being discussed in Sharm El Sheikh as we speak, that is compensation to the poorer nations for loss and damage. So if, if the rich nations help the poorer nations build infrastructure, agricultural and, uh, and civil infrastructure, which is more resilient to whatever climate effects they're going to suffer. And that might be um, coastal, uh, you know, sea defenses to defend against sea level rise or the capacity to run more air conditioned buildings through having solar panels or whatever. You know, if the rich countries genu genuinely transferred substantial sums to the poorer countries, then there would be less need for people in the poorer countries to migrate. So you see my point. It's very difficult to predict what will happen because there are so many unknowns. And, and part, of, part of that answer may emerge at the end of this week. Does that help? Yes, a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot, Vincent. Yes, you are the next one, please. So first of all, thanks for your speech. Um, I already asked a question before you showed your sheet about um, about the tipping points. But uh, do you think there is already like is it too late to stop the, the ongoing process of climate change, or did we reach any any tipping points already? We we can't repair. There's um, uh, again the climate science community is. Uh, discussing this a lot and, and you will find I have colleagues who believe that we are dangerously close to the Greenland tipping point, for example, that um, if, 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 you know, it, it may be that it is that we haven't already pushed it through the tipping point, but it is too late to stop us pushing it through the tipping point because we're still, you know, emitting more carbon dioxide than we should do and it'll be very difficult to turn that off. Um, there are others who are, um, are more, let's call them optimistic, and say, well, we still have a little bit of time left. Um, but what nobody disagrees on is that, and we've been saying this 
you know, some of us for 30 years, time is running out. <laughs> and so the quicker and, 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 and faster and harder that we move, the better, you know, there can be no argument that um, we really need to do something significant. Um, and, and of course, one of the things that I didn't really have time because it was already a very long lecture and, and perhaps I should have done, uh, I get invited to a brief all sorts of um, uh, associations, uh, different businesses, uh, you know, different um, uh, nations, different organizations. And what isn't cutting through into the media is the enormous amount of work that is going on. I mean, in, in unlikely places. So, for example, Coca-Cola, um, which I would not have expected necessarily to be um, uh, a, a you know super example of a company um, addressing climate change and the environmental crisis. And yet um, I was asked to brief them a few years ago and I came away deeply impressed um, by what they were doing. And, and their point was that they have a turnover. They, they you know, Coca-Cola exists in sells products in 180 something nations around the world. It has uh, bottling plants and uh, Coca-Cola manufacturing plants all around the world. They've recognized that water availability is going to be a huge problem to them. Uh, and also they're concerned about their carbon emissions as they move, um, you know, their products around the world. And I was deeply impressed by the program of action that they had. And their point was the decisions they were making 10 years ago uh, and continue to make will have more of an impact on the planet than many nations will, uh, you know, because they have a huge influence. Um, and there are many, many, many good stories like that out there. And, and already the projections of where we're heading are anything up to a degree better than they would have been had we not intervened over the last 10 years in the way that we are. So there is good news out there. And I meet people all the time, amazing people uh, from unexpected quarters who are doing a huge amount. And as you've seen, we're intervening to help people who are stuck um, do much more than they would otherwise do. And we see the benefits of that. Um, so it's definitely not too late. And it's certainly not too late to make things better than they would otherwise be. Um, but back to your point, whether we've gone through or whether we are now committed to going through some of these tipping points, I'm afraid only time will tell. We'll monitor it and see. Um, but there's always sufficient, it's such a complex system, there's always sufficient uncertainty that you're not quite sure where that threshold is, but you're pretty sure that it is there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Um, who is Mara? It's me. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Mara. Um, Hello, I would like to know, in your opinion, what would, would be the most important or rather the most efficient behavior for our um, generation um, to reduce the consequences? It, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I mean, firstly, I would say do something. Um, at the end of this, you know, what? ask yourself the question, what can I do at the end of this lecture, uh, you know, later this evening, which I would not otherwise have done. And the easiest thing is to just talk to somebody about it, either talk to your other you know, student colleagues or better, talk to somebody who you, I, I wouldn't advise talking to a climate skeptic because that can be very difficult and, uh, and uh, uh, it can be a tremendous waste of your time. Um, but if you can find somebody who's sort of slightly interested, but not sure, uh, I don't know, it might be a brother, a sister or, you know, a parent or, or you know, somebody, you know, just just hold a conversation with them. First of all, it will help you consolidate what you've heard. But secondly, it, you know, actions drive beliefs and actions drive other actions. It gets you on the ladder of doing something. Um, I could give you a um, kind of smorgasbord of things that you could do in your personal life, your professional life and your your public life. So, you know, so, you know, vote for the right politicians, eat less meat, you know, ride a bicycle. You, I'm, I'm sure you know all yes. you, know, you can look up on the Web. And what I've learned is that if I offer that to people, 
it's just confusing. And, and, and at the end of the day, you know, you're busy, you've got an exam to take, you know, there's something intervenes and you end up not doing anything. So what I say is what is the one really quite simple thing that you could do? Do it. You will feel better as a result and you will be more able tomorrow to do something else. And, and then think through it's what we do when we intervene with these groups who are that think so ask yourself the question, well, who am I? Where, you know, given that I've only got a certain amount of time and effort that I can expend on this, where would that be best spent? You know, would it be going out campaigning for a political party? Or would it be uh, starting a social network? Uh, to, I don't know, change traffic practices in my city, you know, what, what would it be? Um, if you're employed, it might very well be, you know, if you particularly if you're in an influential, you know, in a company that has an influence, uh, you know, like Coca-Cola, then, you know, building up a network and a, and, a, and a power group within the company to try and make the company do something kind of leverages your effort in a way that might be, you know, very beneficial. But in the end, it comes down to every one of us. You know, what I do is this. You know, I, I, I talk to people as much as I can about it, help them. What I find is that many, many people believe that climate change is a problem, but they don't. If you ask them, do you know what the evidence is? You know, could you just give a brief summary of, 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 of why it's true? Most of them are very confused and, and really don't know. So what I try and do is through these sort of lectures and indeed through the play um, that uh, I got involved in, even if people can't actually remember the evidence and the arguments, it builds their confidence that the evidence and the arguments are there and are solid and believable. And so in a discussion with somebody who's not sure, they can be confident that they're not telling them something which isn't true. So, so you know, in the end, you find your own path um and but the most important thing to do is to take that first step and 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 you know i I've, I've, obviously i I've, you know i teach at a university um i have grandchildren um i get invited to talk to schools a word of warning one of the things that it's important not to do many many young people and indeed maybe um you know people listening here are suffering from climate distress you know you're really upset by the situation and worried about the future um and that's really very very unhelpful um i mentioned that using fear as a means of engaging people is an extremely dangerous and counterproductive thing to do unfortunately a lot of my colleagues do this and the media tend to do this it's extremely unhelpful um, but it's to talk to people and say, do you know what? Um, the situation doesn't look very good. But if we all have an adult conversation and work together, then we can definitely make it a lot better yes. than it would otherwise be. And so I think mm -hmm. that's that's the position that one has to take. Um, yeah. and, then, and then just go out and do it. And, and you feel great. You know, when you when when you really do things, it makes you feel good. Yeah. OK. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Well, I hope that helped. Thank you. Uh, uh, Boris, I think it's your turn again. Uh, yeah, um, hello. Uh, thank you, first of all, very much for the wonderful lecture. Um, yeah, I was as I was listening, I was thinking about uh, all the measures that we could take and all the steps that are in front of you and I was in front of in front of us, excuse me. And I was thinking about the city of Vienna and uh, for example, some park spots uh, have been removed and some green areas uh, has replaced them like trees and flower beds and so on. And I also remember like a few years ago, the streets of um, Avele were painted in white also to reduce the, the overall heat during the summer in the city. Um, all of those things definitely help but they seem as a uh, rather smaller like small steps and i was thinking is this the right approach is it better to make smaller uh, but like mm, like certain steps do we have time for this or should we try something like bigger like on international scale 
that was like um, that were some thoughts uh, running through my mind. Yeah, uh, thank you. It's a very good question. Um, uh, 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 Al Gore, who who I know quite well, uh, always says um, there is no silver bullet, but there is silver buckshot. I mean, basically, we need everything. We need the little things, we need the medium things, and we need the big things. And each of us should try and uh, contribute as many of those things as we can. Um, and so, um, and, and of course, in, in, I, I forgot to say in answer to Marip's question, you know, you're all architects. So so you, in, in the design of buildings that you're involved will, with, uh, will have a huge um, opportunity to make them both more resilient um, and robust uh, and capable of managing whatever the climate circumstances that they are confronted with will be, but also to ensure that they um, contribute as little as possible to the problem so that they have minimum carbon emissions and so on. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, everything, everything is of value. Um, of course, if you happen to know, um, I don't know, President Macron, <laughs> and, uh, and you can have a quiet word with him and tell him that you really would like him to do something significant, then you should do it. Um, but if you don't know President Macron, I'm sure there, are, sure there are lots of other things that you can find to do. And the point is, everything helps. It not only helps truly in the real world, but as I've been saying, it helps psychologically. It helps everybody feel that they're working together in a fair and organized and sensible way. Um, and, and so that, you know, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of uh, I hear some people say, oh, you know, it's all over. There's nothing we can do about it. You know, let's go down to the pub and have another drink. That that is a very very unfortunate attitude. I mean, I'm going down the pub and having another drink, you know, maybe, but but for the right reason, not the wrong reason. So going down the pub and having a drink to celebrate the fact that you've done something useful, like planting some trees or painting a roof white, all of these things help, and uh, and so all of them are, um, you know, really worthwhile putting the effort into. Is that a, is that an okay answer? Of course. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Martina. Um, yeah, I actually had two questions. My first one is overlapping with like questions the other ones have asked, so I'll just uh, skip this one and move to the second question. Um, I was wondering to what extent you believe um, economic development like, goes together with climate change? Ah. Yeah. Okay, well... There is an argument that says um, that it's like um, there's a sort of hegemony or there's um, a, almost a colonial view that the developing world uh, should not, you know, where population is uh, expanding, should somehow not be allowed to achieve the same levels of prosperity as the developed world, because if they do it by the same route, then they will definitely uh, blow us through the 1.5 degree and 2 degree. But, but you can turn that argument on its head and say it is very much in the interests of the developed world to help the developing world follow a completely different prosperity path, which it, and, and it's evident how it can be done. You know, the, the cost um, experience curve of solar panels and wind power, you know, have collapsed to the point now where it is cheaper pretty much anywhere in the world to generate electricity from solar or wind power than it is from conventional coal or oil and gas. Um, and I know there are issues with you know, the, the minerals and so on that are needed for batteries. Um, but the point is that there are technolo technologies which are developing, which if the developed world is generous enough could allow the developing world to achieve levels of prosperity equivalent to the developed world, but at a much lower cost on the planet. And, and again, this is the sort of thing that's being discussed in Sharm el Sheikh. What I thought at first you were going to say, but I, I realized that it was much more to do de with development, is to ask the question, where does neoliberal economics uh, uh, play in this? Um, and you can sharpen up the question by saying, 
if you're an economist and particularly a finance minister in a government, in your mind, do you see the environment as part of the economy, you know, something to be used to generate wealth? Or do you see the economy as part of the environment? And of course, the truth is that the economy is part of the environment, that the planet doesn't care. It's indifferent to what we do. Uh, and if we uh, have a badly designed economic system that does not recognize damages, um, you know, sees them as uh, outside the calculations of cost benefit, then, of course, uh, we're in a very dangerous place. And so it is an absolute fact that the free market economy, as it is currently being practiced, is hugely damaging to the efforts to manage climate change. And there are a lot of bright young, uh, well, not so young these days, economists, um, people like um, um, uh, Donut Economics, uh, Kate, uh, just forgotten her second name, come back in a second, uh, and uh, my colleague Mariana Mazzucato, there's a new breed of, e of economists who are coming along saying, no, 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 we can design an economic system that will both help uh, allow society to be prosperous, but to do so in a way which is um, uh, sustainable and in harmony with the environment rather than not in harmony. So the truth is that to deal with climate change, we not only have to completely transform the way we power the modern world, I mean, 80 percent of the energy that's being generated as we speak is still coming from fossil fuels, only 20 percent from renewables. So this is desperate. So we've not only got to change the way we power the modern world, but to do so, we've got to change the way we finance the modern world. We've got to change the neoliberal uh, free market system. Um, and also to do that, we've got to change the way that we govern the modern world. So the democracies and indeed many non-democratic nations at present are doing what I think we would all agree is a pretty poor job of managing this, governing it. And so there are really fundamental transformations that humanity has to go through. Unfortunately, we've left it so late. Uh, and as I've said several times, we you know, are really running out of time that we need to find some shortcuts between A and B so that we can do the best we can in the meantime and then try and deal with some of these more profound problems over a slightly longer time scale. Great, thank you. Thank you. So I think now we have Leon, right? Uh, Eva. Okay. I think Eva. first is Julian. Uh, you can go first if you like. Okay. Um, so thank you for your lecture. I was wondering what we would have to change considering politics. Like, for example, as you already mentioned, the Paris Agreement is kind of symbolic in retro perspective because it's not binding. And how can we make sure that necessary steps are enforced on a political scale in the future? Yeah, um, I was um, very much involved in polar research, Antarctic research. Uh, for 10 years, I ran the big... Um, uh, institution in the UK, the British Antarctic Survey that, you know, projects 400 scientists a year into Antarctica. And I don't know how much you know about Antarctica, but it was, um, it has been set aside, everything from 60 degrees southward is set aside under the Antarctic treaty system. And so there are 30, I think it's 35, um, you know, participating nations now that are, that form the government of Antarctica. So it doesn't belong to any individual nation, all, all the, terrestri all the um, territorial claims have been set aside. And it's been agreed through the Antarctic Treaty uh, consultation parties that um, it is set aside for peace and science. Now, of course, in the background, everybody knows that there are a lot of valuable minerals and other things down there. So I'm sure that the, um, in the, the big interest that the nations have in Antarctica is not purely um, uh, for peace and science, but for the moment, that's what they operate under. And they introduce on an annual basis legislation under that umbrella of the Antarctic Treaty System. So that is international law. 
and each of the nations participating agrees that, it will then translate that into national legislation uh, to match it. So all of the treaty parties agree on international legislation, and then they enact that same legislation into their national legal systems. And then they will only permit um, citizens of their country to travel to the Antarctic on the basis that they obey that set of laws. And, and they're mainly to do, do with uh, environmental controls and not having weapons down there and so on. So in principle, you could see something like that being agreed through the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, where the conference of the parties essentially agreed um, measures and, um, uh, if you like, international laws that the individual countries that are participating, in this case, all 192 of them, then enacted in their own legal systems to ensure that they uh, essentially uh, you know, adopted them, obeyed them. Um, at present, it, as you say, it's voluntary. And, and indeed, we even saw, um, you know, under President Trump, he essentially decided that he wasn't even going to commit to being part of the voluntary uh, system yeah. for a while. And then, you know, it came back in. Um, what one would like the, the, you know, legitimacy is a very, very powerful driver of human behavior, M much more if, even in our psyche, uh, legitimacy is really important. Um, but I think it's at this stage, we have to say we are where we are and we have to do the best that we can. Um, in the UK, the UK took, uh, and I mean, you know, the UK's got lots of things wrong with it, some things right with it. In 2008, the UK was a world leader in that it, it en enacted a law called the Climate Change Act, which had all party support. And it requires the government to be guided by an independent scientific body, the, the Committee on Climate Change, which is a set of, you know, very um, knowledgeable climate scientists and others. And that, uh, that body, the, the Climate Change Committee, sets emission targets on five yearly bases. And the government is required by law to take actions to ensure that it keeps, you know, beneath that uh, lowering trajectory. And some other countries, I think Spain was looking at uh, doing the same. I'm not sure if it did. I, I've sort of lost track a little bit, but other nations were very interested in this. Um, and it's been very good. The UK has, in fact, managed to keep, um, uh, ha has taken actions which have kept it beneath the first three uh, carbon budget targets, three five-year uh, targets. It will just about make the fourth one, but at present it's going to, the projections are that it will violate the fifth. And in, if it does, the government will have broken its own law, at which point you could say, well, what's going to happen then? You know, you're going to put them all in jail. Well, um, you know, right. some might like to, but, but it, it applies a pressure on government in a very positive and uh, creative way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Julian, sorry that I missed you. Well, first of all, thank my... you for your... Oh. Sorry. <laughs> okay, you can go first as also if you want to. Uh, let's, okay. take, let, let's take Julian because he okay. missed you out. <laughs> so first of all, thank you for your presentation. And I wondered if... To, uh, if you do have or do you have any hope for like future technical innovations which could help in reducing climate change like nuclear fusion or maybe some new ways of construction or agricultural inventions and by that i don't mean that we should like rely on that but do you yeah. draw any hope on that or from that D definitely definitely uh, absolutely i think that that Despite the fact I agree with your last words, we should not rely on these things. Nevertheless, the biggest impacts that we have seen over the last decade have come from technological innovation. The fact that the, um, as I mentioned, the cost curves of um, the experience curve of solar panels has uh, uh, dropped to the point now where in the UK, 
um, it's not the cost of the solar panel that matters to a householder. It's the cost of the team of people you have to hire to climb up onto your roof and put them in. So technological innovation has definitely made a big difference and will continue to do so. And, and new ideas emerge all the time. I mean, techn technological in the sense that that could cover agricultural. There's a big issue at present about sea kelp. Sea kelp, it turns out, is, is extremely effective at drawing down CO2. And so there are several schemes in along various coastlines in the world where sowing sea kelp um, mattresses um, could have a big impact. So it's, it's not just hard technology, it's, it's uh, botanical, you know, biological uh, advances as well. So absolutely, but the danger is that the uh, political world and the economic world will, if, if these uh, technological solutions, the sort of technocratic approach is given too much um, uh, coverage that they will sit back and say, okay, well, we, we don't have to tackle the hard problems then that confront us. As I say, we need everybody to work on everything. And, and nuclear fusion, I mean, you know the joke, uh, I mean, as long as I've been alive, nuclear fusion has been 40 years away. Um, there seem to be signs that it may be a bit closer now. And of course, if it is, um, that could be uh, hugely impactful. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Thank you. Um, may I ask an additional question to what Julian just asked? Because friends of mine are working on so uh, space-based solar power. It's quite an issue at the moment. What do you think of that, Chris? Um, yeah, I, I um, it, it, this has come up recently, actually. I have some colleagues who are quite enthusiastic about the idea of space-based uh, solar power. Solar power, in principle, uh, you can collect a huge amount of uh, of power uh, with a big space installation. Um, the problem is getting it down to to the ground in a safe way, you know, as a microwave beam or whatever. Um, I, I had imagined, I had, uh, you know, I'm a physicist, but I hadn't, you know, had time to look into it. I, I, in my mind, there was this sort of beam, you know, like a laser beam of um, of uh, high energy power coming down to some receiver on the ground. Sounded a bit dangerous to me. I'm assured that you could. Um, deliver it diluted over a sufficient area that it would be a viable source of power. Um, I, I absolutely no expert on this, you know, let's wait and see if, 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 it, um, if it can work and if investors are convinced enough that they invest in it, great, you know, it'll be another, another part of the solution. Thanks a lot. Um, Leon, now it's your turn. Please. So it's not really a question. It's a, more like an observation in architecture that I made that um, a lot of architects just adapt to the climate change and nothing change really something. They build like under the protection of uh, climate changing the line in a desert, which provides a like livable climate in the building but outside of the line it's going to be much hotter in the air and the surroundings and i think that's a huge mistake in thinking that we always think about the easy and fast way to adapt to something than changing something really uh, absolutely you need to take a systems view so you need to take an end-to-end -end view in, interestingly, I was asked a year ago to give a talk to the um, International European Real Estates Body Organization. I've forgotten their name. You know, I'd never heard of them and I had no idea what to expect, but they held a meeting in London, about 400 of them, representing companies that own uh, uh, apartments, uh, you know, apartment blocks and small businesses all over Europe. One of the companies said they owned... Um, a German company, they said they owned a million properties across Europe. Um, and I, I was blown away. They, they are doing an end, they were doing and have completed an end-to-end -end study of what it takes if you're building a new apartment block 
to use completely recycled materials, you know, recycled fabric, concrete, and so on. And the problem they had there was that there are very few construction companies in Europe who are capable, have the skills, or are willing to do this because it's more complicated and more expensive. And they were refusing to place contracts with companies that didn't have this skill. So they were pushing another part of the industry. Um, and they were ensuring that these buildings were designed to be operable in as low carbon and low water, you know, as, as, a, as environmentally efficient way as possible. Um, and they were looking at the end to end lifetime costs, not only of building them, but operating them and then deconstructing them at the end. They were also looking at the existing properties that they owned about how they could refit them in a way that uh, came to similar quality of performance. And what really surprised me was that they were going beyond the physical and they were entering the um, human behavioral side and they were working with their, you know, their residents and their the, the, the people who were renting from them um, to ensure that they operated the buildings in the way that they were intended to be, you know, that they were designed to be, because you hear so often of buildings that are designed to be amazingly low carbon, but you go into them and you find that all of the occupants have got the windows open and, you know, are not operating them in, in the way that they were designed to be, partly because the people who designed them didn't think through how ordinary people would behave, you know, they behave in very, you know, odd and irrational ways. So this group, um, we're looking into all dimensions of this problem and trying to be as robust and low carbon as they possibly could. Um, and my recollection is that they were looking at not only the, the, the issues within the buildings, but in the, in the context in which the buildings sat so that they didn't make the situation around the building worse by an urban heat island or whatever it is. So it, it just... It's, it's all to do with people getting enthusiastic and pulling back and having really, really, you know, exciting and vigorous and, and uplifting and inspiring conversations. And, 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 you know, people coming in and saying, wait a minute, I think we've forgotten this. You know, we need to take this into account as well. And, and you know, that's fun. The, these guys, uh, I call them guys, but it was men and women. They were really enthusiastic. They were really enjoying their work because they felt that they were tackling all of these problems in a kind of holistic way. So it was, it was very uplifting. So does that, is that the sort of answer you're looking for? That, that's what you, we need to achieve. I mean, the other thing is that we can learn from, we can learn from history. There are, there are so many um, examples of buildings from the Middle Ages, you know, built in desert circumstances that were designed with an inner courtyard and with vertical um, you know, chimneys and so on that allowed the airflow through the building uh, to both cool it at night and uh, and keep it at a nice temperature during the day, have quality air th flowing through it, which were completely passive. You know, there was no fossil fuel to you know, operate it in those days. So finding, you know, going right back to first principles on how you design a building that doesn't need to have an air conditioner in it um uh it is you know it's where everybody should be heading yeah that's somehow an answer to this thought but it's like they forgot it that we can do it without air conditioning they only thinking about how we can make it can how it's how we can make it possible or comfortable for the people who live in this building and not about the surrounding, as you said. Yeah, and but, that's. But, uh, but, but one of one of your colleagues earlier, uh, you know, asked, "What can we young people do?" You're it. You know, you will in ten years' time be the people designing these things, and so you can say, uh, you know, if your sponsors are saying, you know, I want you to put a thousand air conditioners in this block of flats, you can say, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know, we, we're going to be different. Uh, we demand to be different. And, um, uh, you know, that's where you guys can um, make the future better. That's uh, I, I, I finish some of my lectures by showing a book with blank pages at the end of it and saying, you know, these aren't written yet. Uh, you can write them. It won't be me. You'll write them. So just make sure you write them, you know, with the right story. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you very much, Chris, for this motivation. Yeah, uh, I think this is the best motivation for implementing it in your next project. The intelligent use of technology and the mix of active and passive measures will be relevant yeah. for the architects. Thank you, Leon, for bringing this up. Maybe someone from the others, you already have a topic. This could be a topic, for example, for the paper work in the module. All right, Sarah, I'm not sure if you still have a question. Um, maybe just because it's kind of similar to the last question, I would just ask, uh, what is your view? Is it more optimistic? Uh, can architecture actually help solving the issue of some regions becoming uninhabitable? And can we find a solution through architecture and not just by running away from those regions where we cannot live soon anymore? And I think the answer is yes. I mean, human beings are very adaptable and, and people live uh, and survive in very, very hot climates, just as they do um, for the moment in very, very cold climates. Um, I mean, just on the cold climate side, um, I had a colleague who worked in uh, Umeå in Sweden and in the middle of winter, you know, it's minus 30 degrees there um, with ice and snow everywhere and completely dark because it's north of the Arctic Circle. Um, in the UK, if we had minus 30 degrees, the entire country <laughs> would grind to a halt. In Umeå, it's completely normal and everybody goes about their normal business. They wear special clothes. They have, you know, special buses, um, but they have adapted to a very extreme climate. Equally, in very hot places, you can adapt. Unfortunately, there is a tendency to adapt in a very energy intensive way. And so the trick is to find a way of doing it which is not energy intensive, or, or at least if it is energy intensive, it's using renewables and, and not fossil fuels. Um, I mean, you, in, in principle, um, you could simply go underground. Uh, and I mean, humans have lived underground. They've lived in caves and so on um, in the past. Um, but uh, it, I would, and, and so I'm sure there are practical solutions, even in the places where, you know, during the daytime, the um, wet bulb temperature would be above 35 degrees or whatever it is, where people would, um, you know, they'd have siestas during that time down in their caves. And then during the nighttime, they would emerge and go around there, go about their normal business. And it's just whether or not that's a very attractive lifestyle. If, in the end, if it's the only lifestyle you've got, then you've got no choice. Um, but I'm not sure that I would want to live underground all my life, you know, however nicely you decorated it, walls and, you know, all the other wonderful things that technology could do. So it's better if we can try and turn the volume knob down first, um, but at the same time adapt uh, to whatever comes our way. Oh, and by the way, um, just on that business of adaptation, one thing I didn't mention is that um, a, a kind of revelation occurred to a group of people I was working with whose job it was to protect London from flooding, from the Thames estuary overflowing uh, onto the uh, London floodplain. And they started by looking at what the climate predictions were for 2100 and how much sea level rise there would be and what you would have to do to protect London against um, that level of sea level rise. And it was all, from a civil engineering point of view, very difficult, and very expensive. And then it occurred to them, they said, well, wait a minute, we're, we're, you know, despite the best efforts of the climate scientists, we really aren't very sure what we will be confronted with in 2100. But we're quite a lot more sure about what we'll be confronted with 10 years from now and 20 years from now. So let's take an adaptive pathways approach. Let's ensure that in this case, London is uh, well protected from flooding for the next 20 or 30 years and do what we have to do to ensure that that's the case. And then slowly roll that forward as more and more information becomes available and we understand better exactly what it is we have to face. So the same thing is true of the design of buildings, you know, hospitals or offices or people's homes. Um, don't try and design 
for 2100. Um, let's try and design for 2040 for the moment um, and, and, and then see where we go. Now, having said that, the lifetime of a building can be 100 years. And so you may be taking a bit of a risk there. I mean, one of the problems we have in the UK is that we've got houses that were built in the 19th century and are still around and, and need to be retrofitted. So that adaptive pathways, that as I think of it, applicable perhaps to buildings than it is in some other areas. But nevertheless, you, you get the idea that trying to solve the whole problem in one go is probably not the wise thing to do. It's to try and take a sort of incremental thing. So, so the answer to the house thing would be you build a house or a, a hospital that will definitely cope with the circumstances it finds itself in in 2040 and 2050 and is adaptable to anything worse that might be coming down the road in the 2070s, 2080s and 2090s. And indeed, that's what they're doing with the uh, embankment in London. Um, they, they're putting in strong foundations so that if necessary, it can be built up much higher. But for the moment, they're only building it up to cope with the next 10 or 20 years. Thank you. Uh, we have we are already 15 minutes over time, but we have, I think, three questions left from Vincent, Martina and Aurelia, right? But I think my, my questions are already answered. Thank you. I also already asked my question. Okay, thank you, Martina. Thank you, Vincent. What about Aurelia? Um, my question is just a short one because like you mentioned the Coca-Cola example and I was just wondering if like there's something like a platform which collect all these good examples to show the people um, the ways you could go to do things better and just to inspire them and to, to show the good things because like all the time you just got to see the bad things and exactly. all the bad things which happen. <laughs> It, uh, I, it, it is so frustrating because there really isn't. Um, uh, I, I, you know, you, you see the occasional article, you know, in a newspaper or whatever, but unfortunately, bad news seems to sell newspapers and magazines and so on, and good news doesn't get the attention that it deserves. And, and I really regret that there is so much good news out there. There's, um, the, the Carbon Trust in the UK offers awards each year uh, to companies that have made um, major steps forward. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's called the Carbon Trust. I can check. There's an organization that does it. And, and so you, if you look around, you can kind of find organizations that are trying to draw attention to really good practices. Um, but it's one of the disappointments and one of the frustrations is that these stories go largely untold. And it's it, it and it and we are very social animals. When we see somebody else doing something, we're very influenced by it, particularly if it's something with which we have some sympathy. On the little estate in which I live, uh, one of our neighbors finally has broken through planning permission problems and has installed solar panels on their roof. I know of several others now who are talking to them and saying, oh, how did you do that? We're interested in doing this, particularly because they're making a fortune with the energy prices going through the roof because they're getting paid for the extra energy they pump into the grid rather than having to pay for it. So, um, you know, may maybe that's something that a group of you could all do in the world of architecture. Maybe you could set up a website where you invite people who've got good news stories to, to publish them, you know, so that so that other architects can learn. It would be a great service. Yeah, all right. That that sounds really good. I think um, yeah, we should definitely think about it and like to put some good news out in the world and yeah, just to make it more popular. Yeah. I, I tell you one little one little anecdote that uh, somebody from the um business department in the in the UK government told me uh, somewhere uh, in the north of England uh, it's a sad story initially uh, a lady's husband died you know they're both quite old and so she had quite a large sum of money from his pension and she thought I want to cheer myself up I need a new car I'm going to buy a new car and she read in a, a newspaper article about electric cars and how they were the you know the thing to go for these days if you're worried about climate 
And she looked at it, looked into it and thought, well, I don't use my car very much. I just use it very locally. So an electric car would be fine for me. I'm going to go and buy one. And at that point, she discovered that the utility, the electricity supplier, was unwilling to put a charging point in the road where she needed it because it was only her. And so she thought, well, I'm not standing for this. And she made it her project. So she fought them and in the end uh, won and they put a charging point in and uh, her, and bought her car. And then her elderly neighbours walking by stopped and said, what's this strange thing, Deirdre? What are you doing here? Anyway, the end of the story is that the street is now full of charging points and everybody else bought electric cars. So, you know, if you can if you can mobilise that kind of copycat stuff that we have inside us, um, then you're doing a great job. You're really pushing on an open door. Thanks a lot for this inspiring history. <laughs> it's good to hear, actually. <laughs> so thank you all for your questions. I think we have to close the session, except if there is one urgent last question that is not in the chat. There was this, this one about um, large numbers of people, billion people living in coastal areas, uh, building swimming cities would help improve the situation. Um, possibly. Um, it would depend on other circumstances, how likely they are to be um, uh, to intercept, you know, hurricanes and storms. Um, it, 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 there are, you know, there would be a whole load of technical issues. You know, what do you do with, um, how do you pump away sewage without, um, uh, you know, uh, polluting the ocean? Um, I just go back to that comment. Any idea is worth pursuing, you know. And and in in the the other thing is that uh, we see in the commercial world, out of a hundred ideas, you know, ten things are brought to um, a trial product, and one of them makes money. So, um, you know, having ideas which don't work, um, th that's not a failure. It, it's really, really worthwhile because, A, you know, you tried it and it might have worked. And secondly, if you publish it, it prevents other people wasting their time and energy on, on, on that possibility. Um, just an architectural example, um, we had, when I was director of British Antarctic Survey, we had a competition amongst the uh, architectural practices in the UK to design a new base for our Halley research station, which is on a floating ice shelf, which is constantly moving, uh, moving the building downstream so that every 10 years or so, you have to move the building away from the ice front. It also gets uh, completely covered in snow and gets buried. And so we had an, an amazing set of, um, of ideas come forward. One of them was a walking building, a building that could literally uh, use its pedestals to move forward in a sort of sliding, you know, it would its feet move forward like a like a mastodon or an elephant, but the building slid along on top of it. Another one was a hovercraft building, a building that could literally lift itself up and float forward on a cushion of air. And, and these were serious, I mean, you know, big, uh, famous architectural practices put a lot of effort into these, spent a lot of money on them. In the end, um, we uh, chose a building that is like a series of big railway carriages, uh, which can be connected together, but can be separated so that they are light enough, they're still very heavy, that they can be towed by a large um, tractored vehicle and then moved individually up and then reconnected. So I can't remember, there were four or five ideas that the practices came forward with. We only chose one and we chose the right one because it's proved it's, uh, it's a very practical um, solution. Um, but the the practice, the other practices had huge amounts of fun doing these other crazy ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, the same would apply to anything to do with climate change, you know, get as many crazy ideas out there as possible. And then the ones that are really going to work will will pull through. I think that's a good point to finish. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chris. It's, it's good that you refer to you brought them because you brought them will have a talk in this module in January about the uh, uh, British Antarctic um, survey. Yeah. It's a, it's a fantastic project, yes. It's a lot of interesting ideas. Okay.
And thank you for your, I would like to repeat what you said, any ideas are worth pursuing. Yeah. And it's not failure is not an option, but failure is more than I, an option. I, I, I'll finish with a slogan. I worked in a space science lab uh, in my, uh, doing my PhD and, and beyond. And um, in those days, uh, getting instruments above the atmosphere to do uh, space research was a very tough game. Often they didn't survive the, uh, the the ride through the atmosphere because they get shaken to pieces on the rocket. And um, so it was quite common that um, instruments would fail on their way up into uh, space or they would fail in space. And the director of the lab said, um, you know, if you're not having failures, I mean, obviously not stupid ones, not, not incompetent ones, but if you're not having failures, he said, you're not at the cutting edge. And if you're not at the cutting edge, you shouldn't be here. That was his attitude. And so that's probably a good um, motto to, uh, to keep in mind, be at the cutting edge, have some failures. I take this, you should, I have to write this. Um, all right, so I thank the students for the interesting questions. Thank you, yes, indeed. And uh, interest in our future. I thank you uh, very much, Chris Rapley, for joining our module and sharing your insights, your knowledge on the topic of climate science. While, and this was so beautiful, at the same time, you have been very positive and action-oriented. And I think this talk was a great contribution to this module. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. And, and thank you all the students for your very good questions. And I wish you a lot of luck. And, uh, you know, go out there and save the world. Well, save humanity anyway. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.